I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. You're a spaceman, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Well, 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 hey everyone, this is uh, Jonathan, um, your humble slave, you're watching Wrestle Rock Podcast Season 3, and I am uh, always with my partner, Benoit, aka Nostradamus, Ben, how you doing, my friend, today? Fine, and you? Yes, 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 I'm the bad. other slave. <laughs> yes, 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 uh, not bad, not bad. So today, everyone, we have a special guest, and honestly, um... Couples of months ago, um, I discover a wonderful person, and he is just not a, a simple guest. Uh, he is a um, a very good friend of mine, and um, he is practically uh, a brother from another mother. So I will introduce <laughs> uh, yourself, uh, Mister uh, Super Later, aka. Uh, Tony Meyer, aka FMW Letter, uh, direct from uh, New Jersey. How are you doing, my friend, today? Uh, are you there? There, man. <laughs> what the fuck, man? Can you hear us? Okay, on that, it's so then. What happened? What's going on? Oh, what's going on? Are you okay, Mr. Myers? Are you okay? Rock podcast for making it happen. Gotta thank Benoit and I gotta thank Jonathan. They also did a hell of an article on me too. Me, FMW Leather, WWS Wing Leather Chainsaw Tony. Me, and whatever else I like to put on, and where is my happy face? Also, too, these guys did an awesome article on me. So you gotta go on there and check out their entire network. Plenty of interviews, plenty of detail to go into that wound up being very therapeutic for myself. I had a blast. So, you know, if you could just do this and do this for me, and believe me, it's going to benefit yourself further on down the line. Because, you see, they're not asking you for nothing. All they're asking you for is just a little bit of your attention to bring to them. That and you wind up being the sole beneficiary person from it all. So, hey, just me dropping in. Friendly reminder, go and check it out. Wrestle Rock Podcast. You can see myself and plenty of other folks. K.A. Uh, Later, a.k.a. Uh, FMW. Uh, His real name, His yeah. real name is uh, Tony Myers. Yes. Uh, how are you doing, my friend, today? Uh, um, I can't really see how I look or how the camera's pointed. I don't know if I'm getting like my entire ugly ceiling in here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, after an introduction like that, wow, man, very humbling. Ah, it's thank you. It's uh, it's always a pleasure, man. Uh, as I said, I discover a wonderful person and a generous smart guy. person, and a smart guy. Yes, a smart guy who know. Uh, the wrestling business from uh, none other. So uh, this is uh, very cool. So uh, we uh, we uh, go forward with uh, some question, uh, Mr. Myers. So uh, what kind of kids you uh, you were and um, uh, when you uh, you were young? Very young. Uh, 
very real strange. Uh, I just, uh, you know, like I, I didn't really find myself, I don't think, until I started like delving into the world of wrestling. I mean, it's just so bizarre. It's anything these people are making out to be stranger stuff I saw. I'm like, there's got to be a story here. Like, how did all these people get together? And what's the idea of the planning process and what's going on with this? I mean, it's just, it is a very strange genre. Yeah. When you're a kid, you haven't really found yourself yet. You're kind of reaching out there. You know, you're playing sports, you're building boards, all that other good stuff. But, uh, you know, once you stumble on the professional wrestling, it just makes you kind of curious. And you go, what, what is all this? You know, <laughs> who are these people? How do they do this? How do they get together? And everybody's got to have a story. <laughs> And uh, we see that you have a uh, really good things on uh, on your basement. So uh, this is a uh, this is your collection of your uh, VHS or DVD. Yeah, and you have a lot of things here. So uh, this is a uh, a treasure. Wow. <laughs> well, if I went to it here, it's like a museum. Yeah. I went through here and showed you everything I'm selling, everything that I've collected, everything. Now I'm just trying to focus on me. I'm trying to get rid of all the VHS and everything. <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't see, like, in, like frame-wise, where I'm usually, like, kind of tilt the camera this way. I'm afraid I'm going to touch anything. Yeah, man, you have a lot of, uh, wow, memorial, memorabilia. Yeah, yeah, memorabilia. So uh, this is very oh. cool. Man. And uh, what? What is your uh, wrestling inspiration and why you decide to, to, uh, to become a professional wrestler? Well, I just, I started seeing stuff eventually that was so bad that I thought, <laughs> you know, I could just emulate that. You know, I was, you know, I was able to imitate everybody from like Lex Luger throwing a punch to like Rick Steiner. So I just started mimicking and then I guess it was, it was about that time that I just, By yourself, you're a kid, you're hanging out in a friggin' basement that's all furnished off and everything. <laughs> I just started wrestling cushions. There's actually a VHS inside here where I'm like 11, 12 years old on a wow. shit out of couch cushions. So Such a good memories. Uh, <laughs> it was uh it was one of those things where I saw And then I started trading for indie tapes and started going to indie shows. I went to, eventually went to indie shows that were so bad. I was like, I could do that. You know, <laughs> it's not to be mean spirited or nothing, but I thought, God, I could do better than that guy. <laughs> Some of the really tiny shows I went to were just that they were really that, that bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I understand. Uh, Many years you crossed the USA and sales, uh, wrestling stuff in merchandise. Uh, why did you decide to stop that? Yeah, uh, well, the more and more that it became like stuff is online, downloadable, and then I got like an entire, like a giant crate of all these magazines from like the 80s and 90s. So it's whenever I get booked here stateside, I just kind of bring some of that stuff with me. But it just got to the point where, you know, DVDs are so out of vogue, even though you can't sign a download. Yeah. Um, And now we are in the era with the digital, uh, so... But, you know, Japan is, like, so much more set back in the times. Like, they still use fax machines. And uh, you're able to sell DVDs there. You're able to sell the 8 by 10s and and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it hasn't completely faded away in Japan or anything. Uh, But here stateside, it's just, I guess, out of vogue. Look at this. It's within reaching distance of me. The guy did that he made these yeah man you have a, a lot of import uh, yeah th- th- this is probably uh, yeah, practically uh, your best stuff right it's from japan though. yeah that's my stuff from japan okay. okay the amazing thing is he only got through two folders of it and there's like 12 folders in total the 12 folders like 60 something gigs alone but most of these uh Folders are like 15 gigs a piece. Mm-hmm. So there's so much stuff that he still has to go through, and there's so much stuff I'm still accumulating. Like, 
uh, I just got my match from Miyagi with um, against Mr. Atomic. Uh, yeah, Mr. Atomic. And that's when he was like a young pledge trying to get into our Isasaki underground task force with June Kasai and Fujita and those guys. But um, yeah, so I'm still like collecting my stuff as we speak, but it, it's not what it was before you could just go to your gimmick table with a whole bunch of old VHS and DVD, mm -hmm. but eh, sign of the times, things change. <laughs> yeah, times have changed. Uh, and uh, with the um, now uh, all people watching Netflix and Disney and all is on digital, so CDs and DVDs are not the priority. So uh, now we're uh, listening to Spotify and stuff like that. So uh, um, the, the times change. The evolution yeah, of the do, technology. But, uh, yes. Some things are timeless. Like, you know, fans in Japan still like bringing and buying the actual like DVD to actually physically have that. And mm -hmm. um, I find myself a lot of times signing stuff like that. Yeah. So, you, you know, you can't get that out of download. Yeah, man. And so, uh, as, uh, as um, uh, what is the name of the, 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 the medical uh, singer? Um, uh, uh, James Atfield. James Atfield. Uh, a couple of uh, years ago, uh, he said that the download will uh, destroy the, the music industry. And that's exactly uh, what, happened. Wh what happened. So, Yeah, torrents and YouTube. And YouTube and torrents are the main thing that Japanese people, that's like why they hate selling any form of multimedia to us because... They think the first thing they think is that Americans are just going to upload it, put it on there, and then piracy. And it's the whole thing of honor it harkens back to with the Japanese culture. So, you know, they still don't believe in downloading anything. They believe in, oh, that's bad. That's stealing. Yes. Which is a great way to look at it. I wish all of modern society was more like that. But <laughs> yeah. And it's the uh, one place on earth that uh, we. We have, I don't even know if you could put it into words. <laughs> yeah, and we have no choice to uh, innovate in uh, in this uh, wonderful world because, uh, as um, Gene Simmons says, um, if you want that people say uh, buy your stuff, you need uh, innovate. So I remember. Uh, that uh, the, the, the band group KISS have probably ten uh, thousands of uh, items uh, in, in terms of merchandising. So uh, that, uh, but if you want to, if you want to make a good money, you need innovative in wrestling. So, <laughs> well, uh, you yeah. started your uh, career. Go ahead, my friend. Okay. You are started your career as Tony Myers, uh, your real name, of course. Uh, not FMW Letterface. Who is your wrestling teacher in the USA? Well, believe it or not, I didn't actually start as Tony Myers. It, it was a bunch of shit that I threw. Oh, man, can I curse? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to curse, sir? Well, uh, okay, so I threw a whole lot of crap at the wall. And um, I was what? Romeo Rodriguez, Spanish fly. <laughs> just... Anything that I could use, anything I could throw at the wall, see if that would stick. But uh, I wasn't Tony Myers until I went to Memphis, and they just needed a job guy name. Okay. Downtown Bruno, Harvey Whippleman came to me, and he goes, Spanish fly is just too strong for TV. And I was like, well, I was using Romeo Rodriguez on, like, Joseph all these tapings that were here locally in Jersey mm -hmm. when I was, you know, doing jobs, teenager. So, um, yeah, it... it, it It is so funny because with all the variations and different forms of leather that I play around with and everything, um, Memphis had me under like a ton of different masks and <laughs> doing all kinds of weird jobs or run-ins or if they wanted something pushed, but he did a guy under a mask because my face had been seen on TV getting beat up so much. So, um, yeah, in, in all... The very first place that I ever went to was Larry Sharp's Monster Factory. Okay. And, okay. you know, I was just like a 15-year-old kid. 
So they okay. couldn't even take me serious. <laughs> they didn't even want to take my money. Yeah. Maybe. So I was like, okay, maybe I could break in as a referee. You know, weeks later, it was actually two days after my 15th birthday that I debuted in a battle royal. Under okay. A mask. <laughs> and nobody, nobody even gave the met the, the nobody even gave it a name. I didn't even have a wrestling name. I just had a mask and, hey kid, it's the middle of a snowstorm. We're short people. Get the hell in the ring. I was like, but, but I'm one of the ring crew, and they're like, ah, we've seen you in the ring training. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, from there, yeah, it was Mike Masters, Rocky Jones Wrestling School. Okay. And, um, so if yeah. I understand, you work with a, a lot of uh, a person uh, in the in the wrestling world. So uh, you cross uh, many as a wrestling school. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, can you explain uh, to us uh, the historic behind the letter face gimmick? So we know that... Uh, Caparua Krishner is uh, the first one who worked with uh, this gimmick. And now... Um, now he's him. <laughs> yes, he's him. So uh, can you explain um, the historic behind all of this? Yeah, Ricky Santana came to him. Um, he was already the corp, I believe, in all Japan wrestling. So um, he would name his kept being battered around Japan and everything. And then Ricky Santana came to him and he said, Hey, you know, they need guys for this new thing to start called wing. Mm -hmm. But three years later, after working straight, Kirshner wound up and, and it's a very famous incident that happened with uh, another buddy of mine that was from Canada, um, Canadian Tigerese, Mike Anthony, Mike Lazansky came from Memphis. I met him in like 93 and they had an incident outside of a bar which if you've ever been in uh, Shinjuku or any of the uh, Rapongi, like any of those, I wouldn't say seedy or red light district, but they could be kind of sleazy. If you've ever been out there in Japan, there's a lot of street hustlers, a lot of people that come up to you. One of them grabbed him and he's like, hey, man, don't grab me again. You know, the guy was stupid enough to do that. He wound up going to prison, so they brought in Rick Patterson, another fellow Canadian. Yeah, one of your uh, one of your country folks. Um, but they wound up bringing him into the replacement. Um, while he was busy with the IWA, some of the dates had conflicted with Pogo and his WWS. So in like 2000, you know, they just had me stand on in. Okay, <laughs> that's brief chronological history <laughs> yeah and it didn't um didn't become the thing till like seven or eight years ago where <clears throat> with everything being out on social media and everything everybody was able to put together clues or they were able to go back in time with video and you know see me debuting with it and all that good stuff but Briefly, that's chronologically as, as far as the history of the Leatherface thing. You know, in the midst of this, plenty of Japanese guys stepped in and tried to do the role and and that kind of thing. But it, it you can't just put it on a human being and be like, okay, you're now a Leatherface. It's if it doesn't have the guy gene thing to it. The, and those fans around Tokyo, they're like the most sophisticated fans on this planet. Mm -hmm. They'll be the first ones to let you know that, like, ah, that's just, they they already know who it is. Ah, it's a Chiro Yaguchi under there. Yeah, it's not really Leatherface. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, um... okay, some of the coaches uh, you've had are uh, Mike Masters, Mike Sharp, Bill Damot, and the Monster Factory. Uh, which one was the the, the roughest uh, teacher or uh, roughest uh, wrestling school? Well, back then, Bill Demont, he wasn't so mean spirited. He had a racquetball court in Lodi, New Jersey, which is only like twenty minutes from me. Okay. Um, he didn't really open that up until like late '93, so that was like the final place. And Mike Sharp was so laid back that he was just, you know, I, I remember watching video cassettes and me. You know, approaching Danny Inferno and being like, try flying head scissors on you. And Mike Sharp just standing there being like, eh, I haven't seen no one of them in a while, you know, like, um, Mike was too late back. Mike Masters was actually a much better teacher because Larry Sharp wasn't really around too much mm -hmm. at his monster factory. 
but Mike Masters was probably the actual best, like teacher, teacher that and stuff outside of wrestling. Okay. Uh, Rocky Jones, Mike Masters. He just passed away like last month, throat cancer, and really, oh. Oh, not to bring it to anything morbid or a down point, but he just, you know, you're talking about a guy that outside of wrestling mm-hmm. really, really had himself together. And there wasn't a territory he didn't wrestle in. You would just have to listen to him because, I mean, he would tell you everything you need to know. And um, he wasn't, per se, like really hard on me or really like really like mean spirited or anything like that. Like I said, it was early on with Bill DeMont. Mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, anything that happened to him later on uh, in life, you know, and all the horror stories that you hear about him and developmental, that didn't, that happened years and years later. But uh, I want to say, like, actually, like, physical wise, Mike Masters was, of all those people, Mike Masters probably the roughest on me. And, uh, Currently, uh, uh, you work with uh, Atsushi uh, Honita in a Battleground Championship Wrestling promotion uh, in the United States. Can you talk about uh, your experience with Onita uh, against uh, PCO and uh, Bubba Ray Dudley? Yeah, I know he had some comments, I guess, on his Patreon thing. Uh, about the match and everything like that, you you have to watch it to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so go to Fight TV to watch this amazing yeah. match, guys. <laughs> Bully Ray is the one that actually found the tables. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Found them at a thrift store because of, to, to try to find those old particle board tables. Yeah, the WWE like a. Yeah, I won't even mention him by name, but he's the guy that hauls all the 18 wheelers and everything for him. Mm-hmm. Um, they all that stuff, the, the ladders, the chairs, the tables, all that stuff is in a giant warehouse. So WWE doesn't even locally go anywhere anymore and just go to an office depot or anything. They have their own stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, going into that match too, I mean, I know PCO has got the, What more could you possibly say about him as a human being that any, anybody hasn't said? He might not be human. He's just too kind-hearted. He's just too nice of a guy. And it was so funny because we're back there and he goes, hit me like you're going to hit me when we're out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and, and he, I, he I just had to like chuckle for a minute and I'm like, I, I know where I am, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not swinging for the fence on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, I re- too, you hear all the horror stories yeah i remember every, you know what people have had to say about him online and this that and the other <laughs> i'm so glad i don't buy into that i'm so glad that i'm i'm that guy that's kind of laid back and, and just kind of like you know what's this dude all about or whatever but it, it was cool because like when i refreshed his mind i was bringing up stuff he's like how the hell do you remember that and i'm like i was there i was looking for work <laughs> that was uh yeah because you know he came to subalpins too so it was like and then with pco he was really tight with sid vicious and so was i like sid even let pierre stay in his home mm-hmm. so the both of us had this you know link with sid and we have like several mutual friends and enough people put him over to me that you know going into there i'm like This is fantastic. Like, you know, I'll throw in a little bit of stuff. Like, uh, you know, I, I went to the whole, I went to Boy Ray and I go, how cool would it be if we did the go backers finish? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, um, and outside stuff like that, like, how hard is it? Just do what you're told. And, and it's like, Boy Ray is so, like, he's so in your ear from the second that you walk up with him, or from the second you start teeing off on him. Mm-hmm there's constant communication. So it's like, how the hell do you screw that up? It's not possible. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, uh, good stuff on the, on this, uh, wrestling match with a, uh, a 
a guitar shot uh, on a, like the like yes, uh, Jeff on, Jarrett. Uh, yes, uh, on uh, Onita and he, uh, he spear through a, a barbed wire table. That was amazing, man. <laughs> that was insane. <laughs> yeah, okay. such a good memory. So uh, we invite you to uh, to go to um, fight t- uh, fight that TV to watch this uh, this event. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very interesting match uh, during this uh, this event. There's I didn't ki- watch, but yes, uh, uh, I will. Yes, uh, there's a uh, a comeback from uh, Ken Shamrock. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, against um, the son of Harry Smith. Uh, why Harry Smith, the the British Bulldog son. Oh, okay. And uh, honestly, if you uh, if you uh, haven't watched this, uh, he's another one, and uh, he's like. He's got to be the nicest guy, but look at that entire roster. There's Casey Navarro, Buddy Matthews was there. Yeah. Um, look from top to bottom. That that entire show was so stacked, and here I am in the mini bank going, "All right, that, that's an ever, honor." Anything, here's honestly, a screwed up thing. To work with all of this uh, current uh, roster. So that that's uh, a great opportunity for you uh, to work with all of these talents. Yeah. The other thing too during the match is if you if you go back and you're watching it, mm-hmm. PCO goes to dive to the outside. Onita just takes off, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all of me and it's all of my shoulder. And something I didn't tell anybody was like three weeks ago I dislocated him. Shit, shoulder, shoulder injury. My left shoulder. Shoulder injury. You're, you're right. Your right shoulder. Damn. This this is a this one's big. This one's had the. Um, I don't know how well he could see it. Oh shit! Yeah. It's coming out. Yeah, yeah. Came we see out it. at one point. The effect of the hardcore so like racing style. I got like a giant hole. God damn! Up here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Onita just completely took off, and I was like, I, I said to Bully, I go, "Was it all right?" You know, and he goes, "You caught him," but I was like, "Yeah, but Onita." <laughs> And uh, PCU give you a cannonball from the top rope uh, under the table, man. That was just who. Oh, and uh, between you and me, uh, PCU is not a lightweight person. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like you see a guy with his size and everything else, and catch him, catch him. Yeah, man. When he dive on you, <laughs> like, you oh shit. On- Hi, Even Pierre, if you listen to us. Table, it's like, if you don't catch this guy, he's going straight to the concrete. Like, yeah. you'll break his fall and, and all that, but still, grab onto him, hold him. Yeah, man. Make sure he doesn't friggin' splatter. And then the, the, I think the cameras missed this one. When he went to reverse me and I went through the rest of the broken particle table, mm-hmm. um, I shot too hard and shot too far and ran too fast. <laughs> my uh, the, the people the people I landed right in front of the guy goes he's got to have a broken leg and the other guy's like oh but you were right man. Um, my shin and like the the side of my calf like cracked into that guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, man! <laughs> PCO's like I didn't even know you were going through the table and not did I. I just got a wild hair plant, you know. He, adrenaline and everything you're just like yeah 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 you know <laughs> and uh at late of uh, october uh you go back to japan what is your plan right there yeah that is just we're post pandemic so everybody has told me and like i was on the phone all night long with takase takase has taken over the finances and wws is now his 100 mm-hmm. percent so Even he was telling me, everybody, Onita was telling me over and over, he's like, you know, within Tokyo, you're only going to get three, four days a week that people are running. So it's like, you know, you're going to have to go to the outskirts. You're going to have to go to like Eagle Pro if you want to round things out and try to even attempt to pull off seven days a week. The post pandemic is the biggest pain in the ass for them. I mean, <laughs> so much is gradually getting back to the way they're. What it used to be. Um, with WWF, there's a lot of stuff of my own personally that I want to finance. And I want to run one house shows there with them. It's all the same stuff that we used to do. And it's to keep talking to his wife from yelling at him and being like, look at how much money you're coming out of pocket for. 
Um, yeah. I, I did the same thing with Bobo. I ran my own just for years. I kind of kept it to myself because people find out that you're running out in Japan and uh, over it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I have to see just how much it's going to go back to normal, how much it's seemingly things are going back to the way that they were. So much has changed as far as like the landscape goes. But it, so much is still similar because for so many years I've busted my ass, you know, freelancing on all those Japanese indies to mm-hmm. build, you know, that, that friendship that, you know, hey, they, they know what I'm about. They know what my company loyalty is. They see my work from the minute I walk in the building, you know, is putting out chairs, whatever. And we wish um, you all the it best. Doesn't, it doesn't end with me and it should never. It should be one of those things that people just, you got to realize you're, you're there to maintain and, and get employment you're not i'm not going to be that fat lazy american that people look at and they go oh well you know he just grabbed his money and left you know yeah i know you go above and beyond the japanese people inspire you anyway with the work ethic you look over there and like ricky fuji setting up the ring it's like come on he's got several years over me what am i thinking why wouldn't i go over there <laughs> yeah man uh well um as usual, uh, my partner, Benoit, predict your future well uh, for ending. Um, so go ahead, my friend. Okay, I, I predict uh, that uh, you will open your wrestling school uh, in Japan or US, uh, whatever. Yes. And... Oh, I couldn't hear that last part. <laughs> and uh, it, the, the most important thing is a good LT, honestly. Yeah, of course. Uh, without LT, uh, we can, uh, you can wrestle and you can live your, uh, your dream. Money can buy guilty. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Myers, for your time. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, for discussing uh, all together, and uh, probably uh, we're we're talking uh, in private a couple of times in, uh, in a couple of weeks. So, uh, thank you so much for your time, my friend, and uh, have a good one. Yeah, it was cool, man. It was, you know, it's been great, man. Going back and forth with you alone is, you know, I got two new friends. How great is that? <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> That's pretty cool. People it, that understand and people that yeah, man. It's all about the distance, but if, it's all about the distance. But if if we have um, technology, we can contact uh, everyone. So that's really cool. So take care of you. Be careful uh, on the road and uh, on a plane. And uh, talk to you later, my friend. Talk Excellent. to you later. Uh, Talk to you later, face. <laughs> <laughs> a word game. <laughs> Absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Have a good one. Goodbye, Take care, my friend. Thank you once again. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Goodbye.